Hello. We're continuing on with our reading of the Oralinda, the 13th century manuscript. I'll start where we left off. Please kick me down a like um, or make a comment. Share the channel if you have friends that you think would like it. All those things help me a lot. So let's get started. From Minnow's Writings. When Nalhenia, whose real name was Minerva, was well established, and the Kirklanders loved her as well as our own people did, there came some princes and priests to her citadel and asked Minerva where her possessions lay. Helenia answered, I carry my possessions in my own bosom. What I have inherited is the love of wisdom, justice, and freedom. If I lose these, I shall become as the least of your slaves. Now I give advice for nothing, and then I should sell it. The gentleman went away laughing and saying, Your humble servants, wise Helenia. But they missed their object, for the people took up this name as a name of honor. When they saw that their shot had missed, they begun, began to calumniate with her and to say that she had bewitched the people. But our people and the good Kirkalanders understood at once that it was calumny. She was once asked, if you are not a witch, what is the use of the eggs that you always carry with you? Minerva answered, these eggs are the symbols of Freya's councils, in which our future and that of the whole human race lies. Time will hatch them, and we must watch that no harm happens to them. The priest said, well answered, but what is the use of the dog on your right hand? Helenia replied, does not the shepherd have a sheepdog? to keep his flock together. What the dog is to the shepherd, I am in Freya's service. I must watch over Freya's flock. We understand that very well, said the priests. But tell us, what means the owl that always sits upon your head? Is that light shunning animal a sign of your clear vision? No, answered Helenia. He reminds me that there are people on earth who, like him, have their homes in churches and halls, who go about in the twilight, not like him, to deliver us from mice and other plagues, but to invent tricks to steal away the knowledge of other people in order to take advantage of them, to make slaves of them, and to suck their blood like leeches. Another time they came with a whole troop of people when the plague was in the country, and said, We are all making offerings to the gods, that they may take away the plague. Will you not help to turn away their anger, or have you yourself brought the plague into the land with all your arts? No, said Minerva. I know no gods that do evil. Therefore I cannot ask them to do better. I only know one good spirit, that is Waralda's, and as he is good, he never does evil. Where then does evil come from? asked the priests. All the evil comes from you and from the stupidity of the people who let themselves be deceived by you. If then your God is so exceedingly good, why does he not turn away the bad? asked the priests. Helenia answered, Freya has placed us here and the carrier that is time must do the rest. For all calamities, there is counsel and remedy to be found. But Heralda wills that we should search it out ourselves in order that we may become strong and wise. If we will not do that, he leaves us to our own devices in order that we may experience the results of wise or foolish conduct. Then a prince said, I should think it best to submit. Very possibly, answered Helenia, for then men would be like sheep, 
and you and the priests would take care of them, shearing them and leading them to shambles. This is what our God, God does not desire. He desires that we should help one another, but that all should be free and wise. That is also our desire, and therefore our people choose their princes, counts, conciliars, chiefs, and masters among the wisest of the good men, in order that every man shall do his best to be wise and good. Thus doing, we learn ourselves and teach the people that being wise and acting wisely can alone lead to holiness. That seems very good judgment, said the priests. But if you mean that the plague is caused by our stupidity, then Nihelenia will perhaps be so good as to bestow upon us a little of that new light of which she is so proud. Yes, Helenia said, but ravens and other birds of prey feed only on dead carrion, whereas the plague feeds not only on carrion, but on bad laws and customs and wicked passions. If you wish the plague to depart from you and not return, you must put away your bad passions and become pure within and without. We admit that the advice is good, said the priests, but how shall we induce all the people under our rule to agree to it? Then Hellenia stood up and said, the sparrows follow the sower. The people, their good princes, therefore, it becomes you to begin by rendering yourselves pure, so that you may look within and without and not be ashamed of your own conduct. Now, instead of purifying the people, you have invented foul festivals in which they have so long reveled that they wallow like swine in the mire to atone for your evil passions. The people began to mock and to jeer so that she did not dare pursue the subject. And one would have thought that they would have called all the people together to drive us out of the land, but no one in place of abusing her. They went all about from the heathenish Kirkland to the Alps proclaiming that it had pleased the almighty God to send his clever daughter Minerva surnamed Nihelenia, over the sea in a cloud to give people good counsel. And that all who listened to her should become rich and happy, and in the end, governors of all the kingdoms of the earth. They erected statues to her on all their altars. They announced and sold to the simple people advice that she had never given and related miracles that she had never performed. They cunningly made themselves masters of our laws and customs, and by craft and such subtlety, were able to explain and spread them around. They appointed priestesses under their own care, who were apparently under the protection of Festa, our first era modra, to watch over the holy lamp but the lamp they lit themselves, and instead of imbuing the priestesses with wisdom, and then sending them to watch the sick and educate the young, they made them stupid and ignorant, and never allowed them to come out. They were employed as advisors, but the advice which seemed to come from them was but the repetition of the behests of the priests. When Nihelenia died, we wish to choose another mother, and some of us wish to go to Texland to look for her. But the priests, who were all powerful among their own people, would not permit it, and accused us before the people of being unholy. From the writings of Minnow. When I came away from Athenia with my followers, we arrived at an island named by my crew, Creta. Because of the cries that the inhabitants raised on our arrival. When they really saw that we did not come to make war, they were quiet, so that at last I was able to buy a harbor in exchange for a boat and some iron implements and a piece of land. When we had been settled there a short time and they discovered that we had no slaves, 
they were very much astonished. And when I explained to them that we had laws which made everybody equal, they wished to have the same. But they had hardly established them before the whole land was in confusion. The priests and the princes declared that we had excited their subjects to rebellion, and the people appealed to us for aid and protection. When the princes saw that they were about to lose their kingdom, they gave freedom to their people and came to me to establish a code of laws. The people, however, got no freedom and the princes remained masters, acting according to their own pleasure. When this storm had passed, they began to sow divisions among us. They told my people that I had invoked their assistance to make myself permanent king. Once I found poison in my food. So when a ship from Flyland sailed past, I quietly took my departure. Leaving alone and then my own adventures, I will conclude this history by saying that we must not have anything to do with Venda's people wherever it may be, because they are full of false tricks, fully as much to be feared as their sweet wine with deadly poison. Here ends Minnow's writing. These are the three principles on which these laws are founded. One, everybody knows that he requires the necessaries of life, and if he cannot obtain them, he does not know how to preserve his life. Two, all men have a natural desire to have children, and if it is not satisfied, they are not aware what evil may spring from it. Three, every man knows that he wishes to live free and undisturbed, and that others wish the same thing. To secure this, these laws and regulations are made the people of Fenda have also their rules and regulations, but these are not made according to what is just, only for the advantages of priests and princes. Therefore, their states are full of disputes and murder. One, if any man falls into a state of destitution, his case must be brought before the count by the maidens, because a high-minded Frisian cannot bear to do that himself. Two, if any man becomes poor because he will not work, he must be sent out of the country because the cowardly and lazy are troublesome and ill-disposed. Therefore, they ought to be got rid of. Three, every young man ought to seek a bride and to be married at five and twenty. Four, if a young man is not married at five and twenty, he must be driven from his home, and the younger men must avoid him. If then he will not marry, he must be declared dead and leave the country so that he may not give offense. Five, if a man is impotent, he must openly declare that no one has anything to fear from him. Then he may come and go where he likes. Six, if after, he, after that he commits any act of incontinence, then he must flee away. If he does not, he may be given over to the vengeance of those whom he has offended, and no one may aid him. 7. Anyone who commits a theft shall restore it threefold. For a second offense, he shall be sent to the ten mines. The person robbed may forgive him if he pleases, but for the third offense, no one shall protect him. These rules are made for angry people. One, if a man in a passion or out of ill will breaks another's limb or puts out an eye or a tooth, he must pay whatever the injured man demands. If he cannot pay, he must suffer the same injury as he has done to the other. If he refuses this, he must appeal to the Berchtmad in order to be sent to work in the iron or tin mines until he has expiated his crime under the general law. Two, 
If a man is so wicked as to kill a Frisian, he must forfeit his own life. But if the Berchtmacht can send him to the Tin Mines for his life before he is taken, she may do so. 3. The prisoner can prove by proper witnesses that the death was accidental. He may go free, but if it happens a second time, he must go to the Tin Mines in order to avoid any unseemly hatred or vengeance. These rules are the rules concerning bastards. 1. If any man sets fire to another man's house, he is no Frisian, he is a bastard. If he is caught in the act, he must be thrown into the fire, and wherever he may flee, he shall never be secure from the avenging justice. 2. No true Frisian shall speak ill of the faults of his neighbors. If any man injures himself, but does no harm to others, he must be his own judge. But if he becomes so bad that he is dangerous to others, they must bring it before the court. But if instead of going to the court, a man accuses another behind his back, he must be put on the pillory in the marketplace, and then sent out of the country, but not to the tin mines, because even there a backbiter is to be feared. 3. If any man should prove a traitor, and show to our enemies the paths leading to our places of refuge, or creep into them by night, he must be the offspring of Finda. He must be burnt. The sailors must take his mother and all his relations to a desolate island, and there scatter his ashes, in order that no poisonous herbs may spring from them. The maidens must curse his, his name in all the states, in order that no child may be called by his name, and that his ancestors may repudiate him. War had come to an end, but famine came in its place. There were three men who each stole a sack of corn from different owners, but they were all caught. The first owner brought this thief to the judge, and the maiden said everywhere that he had done right. The second owner took the corn away from the, his thief and let him go in peace. The maiden said he has done well. The third owner went to the thief's house, and when he saw what misery was there, he went and brought a wagon load of necessaries to relieve their distress. Freya's maidens came around him and wrote his deed in the eternal book and wiped out all his sins. This was reported to the Ermo Modr, and she had it made known over the whole country. What appears at the top of the signs of the jewel, that is the first symbol of Ralda, also of the origin or beginning from which time is derived, this is the Kroder, which must always go round with the jewel. According to this model, Freya formed the set hand, which she used to write her texts. When Fasta was Ermolder, she made a running hand out of it. The Witkoning, that is, the sea king Godfried, the old, made separate numbers for the set hand and for the runic hand. It is therefore not too much that we celebrate it once a year. We may be eternally thankful to Rolda that he allowed his spirit to exercise such an influence over our forefathers. In her time, Finda also invented a mode of writing, but that was so high flown and full of flourishes that her descendants have soon lost the meaning of it. Afterwards, they learned our writing that is the Fens and Thryris and Krukalanders. But they did not know that it was taken from the jewel, and most therefore always be must therefore always be written round like the sun. Furthermore, they wished that their writing should be illegible by other people, because they always had matters to conceal. In doing this they acted very unwisely 
because their children could only with great difficulty read the writings of their predecessors, whereas our most ancient writings are as easy to read as those that were written yesterday. This stands inscribed upon all citadels. Before the bad time came our country, was the most beautiful in the world. The sun rose higher, and there was seldom frost. The trees and shrubs produced various fruits, which are now lost. In the fields we had not only barley, oats, and rye, but wheat, which shone like gold, and which could be baked in the sun's rays. The years were not counted, for one was as happy as another. On one side we were bounded by Huralda's sea, on which no one but us might or could sail. On the other side, we were hedged in by a broad Twixland, through which the Fenda people dared not come on account of the thick forests and wild beasts. Eastward, our boundary went to the extrem extremity of the East Sea and westward to the Mediterranean Sea so that besides the small rivers, we had 12 large rivers given us by Hualda to keep our land moist and to show our seafaring men the way to the sea. The banks of these rivers were at one time entirely inhabited by our people as well as the banks of the Rhine from one end to the other. Opposite Denmark and Jutland, we had colonies and the Bergmogd Thence we obtained copper and iron, as well as tar and pitch, and some other necessaries. Opposite to us we had Britain, formerly Westland, with her t ten mines. Britain was the land of the exiles, who with the help of their Berchtmagd had gone away to save their lives. But in order that they might not come back, they were tattooed with a bee on the forehead and banished with a red dye. The other crimin criminals were blue. Moreover, our sailors and merchants had many factories among the distant Krekelanders and in Lydia. In Lydia, Libya, the people are black. As our country was so great and extensive, we had many different names. Those who were settled to the east of Denmark were called Jutin because often they did nothing else other than look for amber, Jutin, on the shore. Those who lived in the islands were called Letin, because they lived an isolated life. All those who lived between Denmark and Sandval, now the Schilt, were called Sturleiden, pilots, Zeekampers, naval men, and Angleren, fishermen. The Angeleren were men who fished in the sea and were so named because they used lines and hooks instead of nets. From there to the nearest parts of Kirkelanden, the inhabitants were called Kadhemers because they never went to sea but remained ashore. Those who were settled in the higher marches bound by Twixland, Twixlanden, Germany, were called Saxmanen because they were always armed against the wild beasts and the savage Britons. Besides these, we had the names Lanzaten, natives of the land, Marzaten, natives of the fens, and Wood, or Hutzaten, natives of the woods. How the bad time came. During the whole summer, the sun had been hid behind the clouds, as if unwilling to look upon the earth. There was perpetual calm, and the damp mist hung like a wet sail over the houses and the marshes. The air was heavy and oppressive, and in men's hearts was neither joy nor cheerfulness. In the midst of this stillness, the earth began to tremble as if she was dying. The mountains opened to vomit forth fire and flames. Some sank into the bosom of the earth, and in other places mountains rose out of the plain. Odland, called by the seafaring people Atland, disappeared, 
and the wild waves rose so high over hill and dale that everything was buried in the sea. Many people were swallowed up by the earth, and others who had escaped the fire perished in the water. It was not only in fin Finda's land that the earth vomited fire, but also in Twiskland, Germany. Whole forests were burned one after the other, and when the wind blew from that quarter, our land was covered with ashes. Rivers changed their course, and at their mouths, new islands were formed of sand and drift. During three years, this continued, but at length it ceased and forests became visible. Many countries were submerged, and in other places land rose above the sea, and the wood was destroyed through the half of Twi Twiskland, Germany. Troops of Finda's people came and settled in the empty places. Our dispersed people were exterminated or made slaves. Then watchfulness was doubly impressed upon us, and time taught us that union is force. This is inscribed on a Wara Burgat by Alda Gamud. The Wara Burgat is not a maiden city, but the place where all the foreign articles brought by sailors were stored. It lies three hours south from Medipis, Medis Blick. Thus is the preface. Hills, bow your heads. Weep, ye streams and clouds. Yes, Schoenland, Scandinavia, blushes. An enslaved people tramples on your garment, O Freya. This is the history. One hundred and one years after the submersion of Alda Aland, a people came out of the east. That people was driven by another. Behind us in Twiskland, Germany, they fell into disputes divided into two parties, and each went its own way. Of the one, no account has come to us, but the other came in the back of our Schoenland, which was thinly inhabited, particularly the upper part. Therefore, they were able to take possession of it without contest, and as they did no other harm, we would not make war about it. Now that we have learned to know them, we will describe their customs, and after that, how matters went between us. They were not wild people, like most of Finda's race, but like the Egyptians, they have priests and also statues in their churches. The priests are the only rulers. They call themselves Magyars, and their headman Magi. He is a high priest and king in one. The rest of the people are of no account and in subjection to them. This people have not even a name, but we call them Finns, because although all the festivals are melancholy and bloody, they are so formal that we are inferior to them in that respect. But still they are not to be envied, because they are slaves to their priests and still more to their creeds. They believe that evil spirits abound everywhere and enter into men and beasts, but of Waralda's spirit they know nothing. They have weapons of stone, the Magyars of copper. The Magyars affirm that they can exercise and recall the evil spirits, and this frightens the people so that you never see a cheerful face. When they were well established, the Magyars sought our friendship. They praised our language and customs, our cattle and iron weapons, which they would willingly have exchanged for their gold and silver ornaments. And they always kept their people within their own boundaries, and that outwitted our watchfulness. Eight years afterwards, just at the time of Jewel, jewel Feast, they overran our country like a snowstorm driven by the wind. All who could not flee were killed. Freya was appealed to, but the Schoenlanders, Scandinavians, had neglected her advice. Then all the forces were assembled, and three hours from Godesburgt, they were withstood, but war continued. Kat or Catherine was the name of the priestess who was the Bergmacht, 
of Godesburgt. She was proud and haughty, and would neither seek counsel nor aid from the mother. But when the Bergtherian citizens knew this, they themselves sent messengers to Texland, to the Ermulder. Mina, this was the name of the mother, summoned all the sailors and the young men of Ufsvaland and Denmark. From this expedition, the history of Woden sprang, which is inscribed on the citadels and is here copied. At Aldergamut, there lived an old sea king whose name was Therik, and whose deeds were famous. This old fellow had three nephews. Woden, the eldest, lived at Lumkamakia, near Emude, and Ustfleiland with his parents. He had once commanded troops. Tiunis and Inca were naval warriors and were just then saying with their father at Aldergamud. <clears throat> when the young warriors had assembled together, they chose Woden to be their leader or king. And the naval force chose Tiunis for their sea king and Inca for their admiral. The navy then sailed to Denmark, where they took on board Woden and his valiant host. The wind was fair, so they arrived immediately in Schumland. When the northern border borders met together, Woden divided his powerful army into three bodies. Freya was their war cry, and they drove back the Finns and Magyars like children. When the Maggi heard how his forces had been utterly defeated, he sent messengers with truncheon and crown, who said to Woden, O oh, almighty king, we are guilty, but all that we have done was done from necessity. You think that we attacked your brothers out of ill will, but we were driven out by our enemies, who are still at our heels. We have often asked for your Bergtmog for help, but she took no notice of us. The Magi says that if we kill half our members in fighting with each other, then the wild shepherds will come and kill all the rest. The Magi possesses great riches, but he has seen that Freya is much more powerful than all our spirits together. He will lay down his head in her lap. You are the most warlike king on the earth and your people are of iron. Become our king and we will be all your slaves. With glory it would be for you if you could drive back the savages. Our trumpets would resound with your praises and the fame of your deeds would precede you everywhere. Woden was strong, fierce, and warlike, but he was not clear-sighted. Therefore he was taken in their toils and crowned by the Maggi. Very many of the sailors and soldiers to whom this proceeding was displeasing went away secretly, taking Cat with them. But Cat, who did not wish to appear before either the mother or the general assembly, jumped overboard. Then a storm arose and drove the ships upon the banks of Denmark, with the total destruction of their crews. This strait was afterwards called Kattegat. When Woden was crowned, he attacked the savages, who were all horsemen, and fell upon Woden's troops like a hailstorm. But like a whirlwind, they were turned back and did not dare to appear again. When Woden returned, Magi gave him his daughter to wife, whereupon he was incensed with herbs. But they were magic herbs and by decrees he became so audacious that he dared to disavow and ridicule the spirits of Freya and Ralda, while he bent his free head before the false and deceitful images. His reign lasted seven years and then he disappeared. The Magi said that he was taken up by their gods and still reigned over us, but our people laughed at what they said. When Woden had disappeared some time, disputes arose. We wished to choose another king, but the Maggi would not permit it. He asserted that it was his right given him by his idols. But besides this dispute, there was one between the Magyars and Fens, who would honor neither Freya 
nor Woden. But the Maggie did just as he pleased, because his daughter had a son by Woden, and he would have it that his son was of high descent. While all were disputing and quarreling, he crowned the boy as king, and set up himself as guardian and counselor. Those who cared more for themselves than for justice let him work his own way, but the good men took their departure. Many Magyars fled back with their troops, and the sea people took ship accompanied by a body of stalwart Finns as rowers. Next comes upon the stage the history of Nif Tiunas and Nif Inca. And we will stop there. And we'll resume next time where we left off. I appreciate you all. Please um, give like a big hug for me. Thank you.